There's an old train outside of town that was booming across Oklahoma before there was an Oklahoma, puffing and clattering over the prairie like an iron dragon breathing smoke. You know what's funny about this old train? It can take you from here to there across the country. It can take you from here to there across time, back to the way it was on the frontier, back to the land and to the people whose lives built this state we call home. From here you can see the whole history of Oklahoma Territory. Seems like our most distant past was only a moment ago. Back then, a hundred years before now, the prairie of central Oklahoma was as wide and empty as a hermit's dream. Rarely could a soul be seen. Mostly it was a wilderness of grass with occasional stands of blackjack, post oak, and hackberry. But the thing was, there was a treasure beneath that grass. Not gold or silver, something far more valuable than that. Beneath the grass was the good earth. The land itself was a treasure waiting to be taken. And in the spring of 1889, there was a whole nation with land fever. For land is what gave the American dream its substance. That spring, the word was out. The unassigned lands of this last frontier would be open for settlement. A 160-acre farmstead to anyone fast enough to stake a claim and tough enough to hold it. Thousands gathered. And on April the 22nd at high noon, the race was on. <laughs> By foot, bicycle, horse, wagon, train, and mule, the 50,000 came. Cowboys, farmers, city folk, merchants, heroes, and rogues all clamoring for a piece of the American dream. In April, the prairie had been empty. By June, Oklahoma City alone had 10 hotels, 37 restaurants, five newspapers, and seven ice cream parlors. Within a year, there was an opera house. Man, what a sight that must have been to see. Whole towns built in the wink of an eye. But to really understand what it was like, you've got to look to the land. That's where the dream had always been, for a family to somehow build something of lasting value from the good earth itself. And never before or since have people struggled so desperately and so valiantly to achieve their dreams. And so here they were, a ragtag collection of families, they had won the land, but to keep it, they must first survive the seasons and the terrible solitudes and with their minds and their hands somehow make the land produce. But it takes time for crops to grow. And until that first harvest, they lived lives more harsh than the Indians who had wandered this land for so many centuries. At first, many families lived in tents or covered wagons. There was little timber to build houses. So many families lived in dugouts, in the ground, or made homes from the thick prairie sod. Homes they shared with spiders and snakes. The walls were plastered with mud, and the floors were carpeted with gunny sacks. Maybe a box for a table, and a homemade bed. 
And when the thunderheads gathered on the land and the winds came up and the rains came down, it wasn't much better than being outdoors. Winter came. Not much wood for fire. So they used dry manure to cook their food. What little food they had. Some families had brought a few cows and pigs along with them when they came. Some killed rabbits or prairie chickens or deer. Others had cornmeal mush or wild berries or gravy made with bacon grease and flour. Others had nothing at all. The earth claimed many that first year especially the very young. The cold, hunger, and disease were merciless enemies on the frontier. In many areas, those who survived were absolutely destitute, discouraged, penniless, and heartsick. When you think back how it was, you wonder what kind of people could endure such hardship. How could they survive? It seems they had two qualities that we often forget nowadays. One was the strength of their dream, to build something of lasting value upon the earth. The other was the strength of their faith. Together they built churches in the communities of the prairie. And there was something about this mutual activity that strengthened the spirit. People were drawn together, and there was a new song of hope in the land. By spring, the worst was over. People began to build more permanent homes. The children gathered in one-room schools to read McGuffey's Reader. More land was cleared and crops were planted. Corn and vegetables, melons and cotton. And while they waited for the crops to grow, there was work to be had on the railroad, or hauling freight, or cutting and selling fence posts. It was a time of new beginnings. Roads improved and the terrible isolation which divided neighbor from neighbor began to disappear. Soon there would be the harvest, and although hardship and sorrow would accompany the lives of the early pioneers for some years to come, they had crossed a kind of bridge. They had survived, and they had endured, and they had triumphed over odds the power of which we can only imagine. This old train cuts through time like a knife through pie, and sometimes it can take us inside ourselves. For the story of lives lived in the past is the stuff of which our lives are made. Their values, their endurance, the strength of their spirit created our world, created who we are, just as we will create what the world will be like tomorrow.